Notebook on Cities and Culture's Korea Tour is brought to you by Daniel Murphy, David Hayes, and Polar Inertia Journal, an outlet for artists and researchers documenting the urban condition at polarinertia.com. I've heard from some Westerners here and some Korean friends in Los Angeles that Korean baseball games are more fun than games in the West. What do you say to that? Um, I'd probably say the exact same thing. Um, if you look at baseball games back home, um, you get knowledgeable fans who are going to the baseball game basically to watch baseball. Um, Korean games are more about family events or just to kind of socialize with people. Um, here, when you go to the games, every player has uh, basically like a theme song almost for them that every fan sings. Uh, every, all the fans go there in large groups basically with chicken and beer is kind of basically what everybody eats and drinks. And uh, yeah, it's more just about the atmosphere than it is really about the baseball. I'd say back in the U.S., I mean, the casual fan, which is mostly, I, I would say, predominantly male, go to the game to enjoy the game and they know the rules and just follow I don't know just kind of go on about just what's happening with the game but casual fans pretty serious in the states yeah whereas here I mean the casual fan probably doesn't even know what's going on in the field it's it's just it's just more about the social experience really with people so um, there's something going on down there we're pretty sure it's complete it's a completely different atmosphere um, here, like uh, in Pusan, the Lote games in the seventh inning stretch, I mean, back home you'd, you'd sing Take Me Out to the Ball Game. Here they bring out orange garbage bags and everybody puts them on their head as rally caps. I mean, it's just, I mean, back home it's what? Uh, cracker Jacks and, and whatever, hot dogs. Here it's dried squid, chicken, and beer. I mean, it's just a completely different atmosphere. And it's here we sit in a land without Cracker Jacks. It's Korea is the country, and Busan is the city. Here on Notebook on Cities and Culture today, where I'm speaking with Jeff Leipsch. He is the managing editor and partner of Busan Haps, the English-language magazine around here. He also writes in the magazine, and if you live in Busan, you'll have seen him write something, I'm pretty sure, depending what, no matter what sport you like. Have you written about all the sports people like here? Um, yeah, I usually follow uh, the Korean Basketball League and uh, the Korean Football League, or soccer, and uh, as well as the baseball team. But I've also covered um, most other major sports here as well. Did you come from a sports-loving place? I grew up in Canada, but I live uh, right next to Detroit. And it's kind of an interesting area because I live right across the border uh, in a city called Windsor. I grew up just outside, but in the Windsor area, in my county, Essex County, there's a huge divide in sports between Toronto teams and Detroit teams. So it's actually kind of a really interesting place to live when you have people who are Canadian absolutely hating the Canadian team and loving the, the American team, whereas other people are the complete exact opposite as well. So. How did it break down allegiances? I'd say 50-50. I mean, between uh, at least with the Blue Jays and the Tigers or the, the Red Wings and the Maple Leafs, and even the, with the Pistons and the Raptors, I mean, you, it, it's about a 50-50 split where I live. And you've been here now in Korea how many years? Uh, just past 17 in May. You're straight from Windsor to Canada? Or to Windsor, Windsor to Canada. I've done too many interviews. Straight from Windsor to Korea? Uh, yeah, there was a little part before where I was working in Michigan before here in uh, PR, but then that didn't work out, so I ended up coming here. Um, originally, was going to stay for a year, and well, 17 years later, here I am. Now, I can't help but notice, and it's something listeners will notice, too. There's a fair few Canadians here, aren't there, in, in Korea? I don't know about Busan, yes or no, on that one, but Korea in general, a lot of the Westerners are Canadian. Um, yeah, uh, I would say there's probably, a good, I mean, of the, of the Western foreigners here, probably a good 30, 40 percent of them, I think, are Canadian. Um... Do any of you have an explanation for that, or is it just kind of like, oh, here we, here we are? Uh, me, it's the cold. I, I just don't like it. Uh, I, I mean, I prefer the weather here much better. We're on about the same latitude as North Carolina, I believe, here, and, and it doesn't snow here, so for me, <laughs> perfect. Yes, now remember, listeners, we're in Busan. We're not in Seoul. Seoul, it snows, gets colder. Busan, it's by the sea. It's, 
it's just kind of milder in every way, isn't it? Yeah, I'd say we're kind of at least similar to the weather in maybe like Seattle or, or in Vancouver, maybe like the West Coast along the water. Um, luckily, we don't get much snow, maybe a couple flurries once a year, if, if that. But normally, yeah, it's, it's uh, a little bit cooler than other places in the summer. And it's milder in the winter, so for me it's perfect. We have the mountains, we have the water. That's why I think a lot of the expats, when they move to Busan, actually don't want to leave here. They don't want to go to Seoul. Uh, did, they, did they usually not want to come here? Did they want to stay wherever they first were in Canada? Like Busan? I don't know Busan, Canada. Why do I keep saying Canada? Do they want to stay where they first came into in Korea? Or do they, you know, what do, they, what do people think about Busan when they get to it? Busan's kind of hard to explain. It's one of those cities that, on the surface, you think maybe, like, I don't know about this place or something. It's kind of, it's much harder than other cities. Um, Busan's kind of known for its hard, maybe kind of blue-collar stance of people. However, it's one of those things when you're actually deciding it's time to leave, it's actually kind of hard. Um, and people, I think, when they, there's a really close-knit group of, of expats here, as opposed to Seoul, where it's so big and you have a lot of different cliques. Here, it's kind of just a big major coming together of people. So um, I think it's, it's kind of really hard to leave this city. And even I've had lots of friends leave over the years, but even in the last year or so, a couple of really good friends have left, and, and I think a part of their heart is still here. You're in the city of three million, but there's a small town of expats within it, effectively, right? Yeah, I mean, to me, this is the biggest small town I've ever been in. I mean, three, it's actually more closer to four million, and it, I don't know, the city just seems really small. And yet, skyscrapers, expansive subway system, everything a major city has. I mean, if this were in the U.S. or Canada, I'd like to think... It would be one of the more exciting cities in North America if it were here, but in Korea, it's sort of like this is the laid-back, sleepier major city. Because the comparison's always Seoul, is it not? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, the vibe in Busan compared to Seoul is, I mean, it would be comparing like New York to Miami, maybe. I mean, just the, in New York, you have the hustle and bustle of Manhattan or whatever, as in Miami, it'd be more like just kind of laid back people now i'm not saying Busan is is like miami by any stretch of the imagination but i mean it's just the the laid back atmosphere of the people things move slower here um people i would say like they're, they're just more reserved in, in their demeanors and they're also very tough on the exterior but in but inside i think they're, they're good-hearted in nature i mean it's kind of like I said, maybe like a blue city, blue collar town like like Pittsburgh, on the beach. <laughs> yes, it's it's fascinating because yes, there's the big city infrastructure, there's the beach location, but the Koreans here, when I talk to them, when I can understand the Busan Satori, it's like they sort of have an attitude like they're living in the countryside as well. That's a combination of all those three sensibilities, isn't it? Yeah, I would say that exactly. I mean, you you can have um, almost like anybody you meet here they're, they're kind of almost like country people in, in some respects however i mean some of the people you'll meet here are some of the nicest people in the world um they they try to have um i mean busan has been trying to make itself into like a global city and trying to internationalize itself but i mean you can do that on paper as much as you want but when you actually get here i think people are still very Korean at heart. I mean, and, and um, even when I go to Seoul, I, I mean, I always actually speak in the Pusan dialect as well, so I always get laughed at there. But I mean, How do the Seoul people know what to make of a white guy who speaks in Busan Satori. I get the Robert Harley all the time. I mean, it's he's known for his dialect and, and living down here but I mean I actually kind of make it a point of pride to when I go to Seoul to actually speak in the Busan dialect and I, I don't want to cater to their to whatever the Seoul people think I mean I'm actually kind of proud to live in this city and kind of even when I go to Seoul I'm actually kind of proud to represent what this city is it's a good example of something it just it's said very differently in Busan than in Seoul 
Uh, oh, jeez, let's think. Or is it more to you about intonation or cadence than it is about vocabulary? Uh, intonation's a big part of it. Like I said, it's, it sounds more. It sounds more tough. Um, uh, you know, it's kind of funny because I, I honestly sometimes don't even think what is Poussin Saturday. Well, you're in it, yeah, I, asking the fish what water is, you know? Yeah, I mean, I honestly in some cases don't know that I'm even speaking Saturday. It's just the language that I know and what I've learned. Is there some Poussin slang word that you really like? Uh, I don't know if, I know if it's a Poussin thing, but I always like to say Monde. Uh, just like, like, what's that? <laughs> or... Um, God, jeez, I don't even know. <laughs> There's just so many that... If you say that fast enough, it sounds like Poussin Satori to me. I, I, know, I mean, I know what it means from having studied the language, but down here, sometimes people, people address me, and I'll, I'll just be geared up to think they're going to speak in this dialect that I won't understand, when in reality, they just talked fast, or they, they said something I know, but my mind was so geared up to think this place is different that I just sort of psychologically decided I wouldn't understand them. I mean, there's there's something... Was this the first city that you came to in Korea? Or what, did you, were you somewhere else to begin with? Uh, no, this is the only city I've lived in in the entire time. So you didn't have that. You weren't like, now I'm going to a different place. You were going to a different place that was Korea, not a different place that was Busan. Yeah, I mean, so I've only known this city and kind of the mannerisms of the people and... Um, yeah, just the language itself too. So, like, even when I travel, I don't know which which I'm doing now. An interesting thing is, I, I have a couple of Korean friends who are from around the Daegu area, and they, and they would tell me that they too, I mean, could change their dialect to one if they didn't want other Koreans to know what they were talking about. So, they, I mean, they have their own um, idiosyncrasies and things that whatever they kind of have like that. But they can change their dialect if they don't want Busan people to understand. It's like a secret code. Yeah, I mean, even Jeju, I mean, nobody understands those people. <laughs> That's all I've heard. I've never met a Korean who claimed to. Uh, I, I mean, I've met a few people from Jeju, but I mean, I remember, I forget the movie I watched uh, a few years back, and they had gone to, uh, the, the, the film was based in Jeju, and it was actually one of the most funniest scenes I've ever seen in a movie in my life. Uh, with translations, um, I, I don't know what kind of language I'm allowed to speak on your show here. But, Any language? Okay. Well, in the scene, uh, there was this man who I think owned a travel agency or something in Seoul, and he visited Jeju and fell in love with this guide. And so this guide, the, the woman, was explaining um, the difference between Seoul Mal and Jeju Saturday. And the scene was basically she was walking through the fields and there was this Korean grandfather out in the field. And so she said hello in the Jeju dialect, which uh, translated on the bottom, like with the subtitles, was hello, grandfather. Um, and all she basically said was, instead of Anyonga Seo, she said it like Anyonga Shoi or something like that. But the next question was, uh, or the next thing that that they said was something like oh, no more doil. Oh, no, no more doil. like today's very hot but the English translation was pretty fucking hot outside isn't it Gramps <laughs> and that was the translation the Gramps is even funny you know, it was, I think I almost cried and I actually had to pause it and rewind and the whole thing was oh and young as hell whatever it's like yo Gramps what up <laughs> which I mean in Korean language would absolutely never happen, of course, With, uh, but it was just one of the most ridiculous things I've ever seen. You say you came to Korea because you didn't like the winters in Windsor, but that doesn't make Korea the natural choice necessarily. What else brought you here? Oh, long story, honestly, but um, I had actually decided to, to come overseas after um, doing an internship in Detroit. And I was kind of thinking about coming over to between uh, Korea or Japan. And I ended up meeting a Korean family. I was introduced to a Korean family in my hometown who turned out they were actually from Pusan. Um, and they actually kind of introduced me to about Korea. And so I decided, okay, I'll go to Korea. What did they say that sold you on Korea so much? Or what was something they did or something that you just got introduced to that made you think, this is a promising country over there? Uh, I just actually kind of remember how friendly they were. And they, and they were like, um, 
Yeah, I mean, they're like, Korea is a, a great place to go. And I mean, this is back in 1997. So um, when I got here and I finished my first year, I went back and actually met the family again. Um, but I had actually met the father the first time. When I went back, I had met the mother. And the mother didn't know that I had talked to her husband. Now, the interesting thing about this was me and the mother um, started speaking in Korean to each other. And so she was, they owned a supermarket. And so she was speaking to me in Korean. And then her son walked out, who was maybe about 16 years old. And she's speaking Korean to me. And he's just like, oh, my. <laughs> yeah, that's, the son was just stunned because I don't think she'd ever heard or he'd heard uh, his mother speaking Korean to a, to a white guy before. But I mean... But I started speaking back in Korean, and the kid just looked floored. Right. So that's, that shows, it shows you had an interest in the language, because after a year, I mean, a lot of expats here don't, haven't really studied much. But you could actually have a conversation just that first year after, after being here that long? Yeah, and the, and the interesting thing was I never really studied. Oh, I see. Um, I just kind of picked it up, and a lot of it I learned was from taxi drivers. Ah, oh, I see. So um, yeah, I mean, I just, and again, that's probably the reason why I speak the Korean that I do. But I mean, I it was just one day I remember I was in somebody's car with, I was in a car with uh, three Korean friends and they were all talking and for some reason I just understood everything. And I said, you said this, you said this, and you said this. And they all looked at me and went, Wow. <laughs> the process was gradual, yet seemed sudden like that. Yeah. Um, I think it was just at first because I just kept hearing the same things over again. Now, I think one of the things with Korean and English uh, and why Koreans have a hard time to learn English is because we can have 25, 30 different expressions to say one way, but they kind of have a general... I mean, I, I'm sure if I knew the language much better, a lot deeperly or a lot deeper, that it would be much more in-depth, but... For the most part, I mean, the most common expressions are always used. So it's just kind of easy to pick it up, and um, I guess that's kind of how I got speaking Korean. How soon were you were you doing media-type work here in Korea? Um, I didn't really do media-type work for my first ten years here. It's kind of been about the last five, I would say, that I really got into it. Um, and actually... It was because Bobby McGill and Mike Schneider, my partner, two of my partners, uh, started this magazine. Um, when the magazine started, um, I wasn't involved with the first issue, but I met Bobby, who brought a copy of it to the, the bar we were at, and I looked at it, and I thought, oh, that's interesting, um, and I really wanted to get involved with him, so um, I offered to help those guys at first and then it's just kind of grown from there so what was Busan Haps like at that time when you saw that first issue uh, Bobby did the first issue I believe on Microsoft Word <laughs> the default choice yeah the default choice I mean Bobby I don't think I mean he's a trained journalist but I don't think he, he had any design experience and he actually didn't do a pretty like did a pretty good job for for what he did and then um especially with the first issue on, on word <laughs> but again um we grew it from there uh the articles i mean it's actually the articles weren't that bad um we just needed a lot of work and uh, we were all just kind of getting into it and then we ended up getting russell mcconnell um who's a fantastic uh graphic artist to to, to um do all of our design work and he brought our magazine up to a completely new level so i mean it was just graphically it changed about issue 12 or 13 i think into something that really looks good um and then we changed it into a from maybe i think we've grown from 32 pages to 64 within the course of two years um, and then when we got going on our on our website and when we started to really, really get into it, um, we've just, I mean, our traffic kind of doubled over the first year to the second year um, and then to what it is today. Do you guys primarily consider yourselves a print or a web publication or is it a 50-50 kind of thing? Uh, it's hard to say, really, because our print is bi-monthly, but our website we update every day. And this is what makes us different than any other um, 
English magazine in Korea. Um, now the other two major ones in Seoul, they only do a they do a monthly print. However, they don't really focus much on the web like we do. We do a bi-monthly print, but we also focus every day on the web. And this is the thing that's kind of made us stand out to everybody, where our name gets out every day, whereas theirs just gets out once a month. Um, and so I think that's kind of given us a, an advantage over um, those guys, especially in terms of getting... Um, I mean, I honestly don't know how many stories that they've done that have gotten picked up internationally, but we've done quite a few that have, so... Was there was there much English-language print media at all before Busan Haps? Uh, there had been a few other magazines who tried to do it, but... In Busan specifically. Yeah, in Busan specifically. But I'm not sure that they... Um, they weren't really taken seriously, seriously, but I mean, the guys who were doing it... Um, tried, but I think it was just something that Busan just wasn't ready for it yet. It's, you do need a critical mass of English language readers, and do you think of reaching purely foreigners, or is it also Koreans who want to read English? Oh, no, we, uh, we focus on both, um, because there's quite a few Koreans who travel overseas and come back, and they, they want to pick up their English. We have a couple of uh, language institutes who use our articles um, for teaching, and um, yeah, it's just we, we like to, I mean, there's only a certain amount of foreigners here in an English market. I mean, I think it's absolutely necessary to have Korean readership as well. And how do you go about getting that Korean readership? How do you, is it a specific process of gearing things toward them, or is it making, a, making it into more globally, like a more global style of English, or what do you have to do? Well, it's kind of interesting because what I like to do is, is to look... If I see a Korean person reading my magazine, what I like to do is actually just watch them and like see. On the subway, you see this? Yeah, um, anywhere. We're like at a hotel or at a bar or wherever they pick up our magazine. I like to look at what they flip through and where they stop. Now, what I've noticed is that their reading habits are completely different than uh, maybe not completely different, but they're different than than the expat readership. Um, what I've noticed there is that they stop on a lot of the small articles. They're not so much interested in the features, but they're much more interested in food reviews, um, like anything with restaurants or cafes and things like that. I mean, especially um, with women readers. They're interested in beautiful pictures of food with short little details and new places to go. I mean, that's what they're really looking for. Um so it's kind of, we can see like a lot of the expats are more interested in um, what kind of, what social issue is going on or some, not everybody, but I mean, some are looking at um, what kind of scandal or things like that because they don't get that news that the Koreans can get in their own press. Newsy news. Yeah. So, I mean, we have stuff that comes from the city things like that. Um, of course, they also want to know the events, but I mean, a lot of the Koreans want to know where the expats are going. Because sometimes like when, it, like if a new restaurant opens that has, say, Mexican or Brazilian or Thai or something like that, they want to go to those places too. I mean, the, the women in, especially women magazine readers or, or just even media consumers, they want to know where the coolest places to go are. And I mean, there was also, um, maybe as of 10 years ago, there were no real Western-style pubs or bars in this city. But once they were built, or even if it was a mix of Korean and uh, foreign style, th those became the ones that are popular. And again, I think a lot of it has to do with, like, they want to experience Western things, and they want to have kind of a freedom to to be able to just enjoy themselves without the rigid, strict um, culture that they sometimes have to deal with at their own places. They want to get away from these obligations that bind them everywhere else. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, for example, coffee shops never really exploded here until a, within, again, the last five to ten years. There were never real places to go and hang out. Um, they had the old style coffee shops, but they weren't like this. I you get mean, the sort of instant coffee with the sweet Nerardi in it and all yeah, that. I mean, it was it was horrible coffee with a telephone at the table, and it, it was just it wasn't really a place you could go and enjoy. 
What else was Busan missing when you first got here? You were here before this boom of the last 10 years with all this stuff that's come in, this international stuff. So what was it like when you first got here? What kind of city did you find? How different was it from now? Oh, geez. It was a com- it's night and day. Um, when I first got here, there was no major supermarkets. There was... Um, uh, I mean, the subway was still being built. Um, it wasn't re- operational at all when you got here? Uh, only the first line. Um, the second, the third. a very useful fourth. line, that line one. Yeah. Um, but I remember, like, everything was buses. But, I mean, the construction here was going all around the city, so traffic was an absolute nightmare. And, um, yeah, it was really kind of hard to get around in some ways. But, yeah, there was, when I first got here, bars closed at midnight. Which, to, I mean, to the to the average, I mean, when you talk to people now, it doesn't even seem fathomable that 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 even happens. I can't even remember that at time. But I mean, and it wasn't that long ago in the grand scheme. Yeah, and and the interesting thing is, but I mean, the, I mean, the Koreans are ing- ingenuitive. I mean, they have a way to get around everything. So I mean, the bars would close at twelve, but they would have beer marts that would open all night. Um, the biggest thing I would say though is there was no. Uh, I don't even know how to explain this, but there was no outdoor um, places to go. No places had a terraces or patios or anything like that. They're everywhere now. It's almost like when you build a new place, you have to build a terrace because people like to, to enjoy sitting outside. I remember this even up until 2003, this, that they weren't even here. And I remember me and some friends would go and sit outside, and, and the girl I was dating at that time would ask me, like, like why do you guys sit outside? I'm like, because it's sunny. And we're at the beach. I, well, I don't want to sit indoors. Yeah, there's, there's no outdoor eating culture that had taken root in a beach town until quite recently. Yeah, and the weird thing is they had it in some places in Seoul, but never... I mean, Busan has, has seven beaches, and there was no place to sit outside. It, it was just, we couldn't figure it out. So even if you're out... At Hyundai, eating fish, you couldn't sit outside. Well, I mean, they have places, but I mean, you were always kind of confined under a tent. Right, there's Pojang Matcha, certainly. Yeah. But yeah, and in Kwangali, which now, I mean, has probably the most coffee shops per capita on one road in the world. I don't even know if it's even comparable, but um, there was no outdoor seating. And it was just, we, we couldn't understand it. And then finally, I think... Uh, There was this one little bar that that opened that just happened to have outdoor seating. And then I think maybe, I don't remember if Starbucks was the first place that came, but they were the first ones to have a patio, I think. And then it just exploded. Uh, And what was the, when was the era you started thinking to yourself, Korea's changing pretty quick? You know, it's always kind of been like that because you can you can honestly go away from the weekend and and a, and a whole new store's opened. I've never seen anything like it anywhere where something you can go away for two days, come back, and the, the bar you were at is now turned into a phone shop. Um, the change here is so rapid that it's if you blink you miss it and you're almost kind of look at some places like what was that store yeah, i don't even remember i don't even remember and then the next day it's like this the only now that space has been like 10 stores since you got here or more 100 stores who knows except the one thing a lot of us never understand here is like for example if a phone shop closes somebody else will open a phone shop and like did, did you not just see that one fail yeah. or the 10 across the street what did you think happened to them yeah i mean i don't there's, there is kind of in a ways a lack of variety here because once somebody actually gets a good idea, um, everybody around the area will copy it and, it, and it just magnifies like crazy. I mean, the amount of chicken restaurants here that whatever. Now, some, in some good ways, they they do improve and they, um, and the quality gets better. Except now you've got 25 chicken stores, and if you want to eat something else, you, you, you're stuck with chicken. <laughs> You've, you've seen a lot of change here, and it's the kind of change, though, that makes you think... Or does it make you think the city is generally improving? And you, you have to think that, right? Just because of what wasn't here before. It's, the general direction is up, yes? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, one of the biggest... Com- I don't know if a complaint is the right word, but it was... The drinking scene here has always been lively. However, the, the selection of what you could drink was not... And 
um, recently, Pusan has been, I mean, Seoul, it started in Seoul, but uh, the craft beer scene has become hugely popular here. Um, whereas just even in the last year or so in Pusan, um, it's, it's exploding, which is great because, I mean, now that you have these places to enjoy, but you don't have to drink. Gas height no B. Gas height no B. Um, but even just like Did with you the, get the other one, uh, there is another. There was another one, right? There's a fourth Korean beer, or was it always just Cass Height OB? I think those were the majority, but I, I can't even remember what. Oh, Kafri maybe is what you're thinking of, but yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's just uh, the the choices were were horrible. Um, but yeah, again, like these days, um, we've got our own. Uh, a friend of mine, Stefan from Canada, has opened up his own brewing company that's exploding right now around the peninsula. Um, there's another place that just opened up down the road that has 170 craft beers, mostly from the U.S. So it's no longer worrying about choice. Um, but have they made their way to the baseball stadiums, these craft beers? No, because I think they're pretty much still owned by the conglomerates. So, so you're stuck. Unless you want to, can you smuggle in other beer? Uh, you know, I've never tried. <laughs> I've never. That's it all right there. I've never actually paid for a ticket to a baseball game, so. I see. How did you begin writing about sports here in Busan? Um, just something I've always been interested in. Um, I mean, I kind of always grew up watching and playing sports, so when uh, we were doing, like, when we started the magazine, um, Bobby had been more interested in doing like politics and things like that, where I focused more on entertainment and sports. Um, and it just kind of grew from there. And then I kind of branched out after I start to started to work with um, the basketball team, the baseball team, and uh, the soccer team as well. Um, one of uh, the best things about when I really got into it at the time was that uh, Jerry Royster, um, also from California, was the coach of Lotte at that time. And we got in really good with him, and we became really good friends with him. And so we used to take him out, and so he got us a lot of access to the, to the, to the Giants. And uh, we used to actually have uh, foreign fan parties with the players, which really grew... Um, their fan base as well with the foreign community. We should underscore here for listeners that don't know that in Korea, teams are, are they for every sport tied to a corporation, not a city? Yeah. Uh, yeah, every team is, uh, I mean, Pusan is sponsored by Lotte, um, by KT for uh, basketball, and by the iPark Hyundai for soccer. Yeah, so every team basically is sponsored by so it's how do, how does a Korean sports fan growing up decide what team to what team to to follow to like? Given that they can't necessarily just go with their hometown, they they don't really have a. I mean, they're the corporation their father works for. How do they know? I honestly don't know the answer to that, but I would say mostly it's about the city they live in. Now, Busan is actually the, by far the most crazy uh, baseball town. I mean, even when they when their teams play in other cities. The Lotte fans are louder than the home team. Uh, Lotte fans are kind of known for being very passionate and crazy about baseball. Um, however, like a lot of the other leagues, I mean, the basketball league and the soccer league, um, the, so the, ba the basketball league doesn't have much competition in the winter, but, I mean, the football league's really struggled here, especially even with what's happened with the World Cup. Um, they still struggle to get attendance. I mean, the World Cup here... And the Korean national team, which, I mean, obviously the fans are crazy, as everyone saw from the 2002 World Cup. But it's not about the soccer itself. It's about just the pride and the nationalism of the team. What was it like being in Korea for that World Cup in 2002? Absolutely insane. <laughs> yeah. Um, however, I mean, there was, there was good and bad. I mean, during the Korean games, it was... Probably one of the best times I've had in my life. It was absolutely crazy. And it was actually one of the times where I've actually... It was one of the first times I actually saw, like, the Koreans really let loose and really have a good time and cheer. I mean, everybody was in a good mood. It had just come after 
um, the economic crisis, which happened in 97. So, I mean, there were so many people for years that were, I guess, kind of depressed or just kind of mellow or whatever. Because I mean, in Korea, it's not really a good idea to celebrate during bad times. But 2002, I think everybody let loose. And it was, it was a great, great atmosphere during the Korean games. The other games, on the other hand, not so much. I mean, I mean the, after the first game, uh, when Korea beat Poland 2-0, which was in Busan, I've never seen anything like it, ever, even to this day, the party that happened in Busan that night. However, the next day, <laughs> of all things, I went to... Uh, I came to this area and I was looking for a place to watch uh, Italy and I forget who they were playing but I remember going to this bar and it took me I think four or five tries but I went to the bar and asked the owner like can you put on the World Cup game he's like uh, the World Cup's over I'm like what he's like it finished yesterday Korea won I'm like that was one game there's more games and he didn't even know he thought the whole thing had, d- had finished because Korea won? Yeah. So he, he didn't even realize that there were more games. He just thought there was only Korean games. And I just what a letdown for him. I just looked at him and went, what? <laughs> <laughs> now, the thing was, I mean, he finally did change the channel. And, I mean, the other people on the bar were all kind of, they all turned to the TV and started watching. I mean, I don't think they really had an interest either until somebody put it on and let them watch. And then, it's like they didn't care about outdoor seating until somebody put it out there. Starbucks, where we sit now, in fact, and uh, then they paid attention. Yeah, almost. <laughs> it was like, yeah, it was just kind of one of those moments where you're like, had such a good time, and then the next day you're kind of back to reality, like, oh yeah, this is, there's where I am. <laughs> now you got here then in the sort of depths of the financial crisis then, didn't you? Or, or what, what, how, what was the situation with the economy when you showed up? When I showed up, uh, it was May of 97, and the, the financial crisis, I believe, hit in October or November. So, I mean, when I got here, I think the U.S. dollar was at around 650 or 700 won to the, to the dollar. And within three months, it ballooned up to 2,000. So, I mean, everybody... Um, I mean, the Korean businesses, families, everybody who I saw, I mean, just was in shock and panic. And, it, I mean, they didn't even really know what to do. But um, So what did you see going on around you? I mean, were, were things just shutting down in, uh, in, in everywhere you could see? Or was it, was it not that visible? Oh, it was visible. I mean, it was visible by what was going on with the businesses, and it was visible by what was going on with the people. I mean, people looked scared. However, I mean, the one thing, I mean, to this day, I I mean, I couldn't imagine many other countries doing this was when they had their collecting the gold campaign where um, the people, I mean, I've talked to a lot of people said, like, we can't let our government handle this. We're going to handle it ourselves. And so, I mean, all the Koreans took their gold from home, their own personal gold, and brought it and raised a huge amount of money. I mean, I'm trying to think of any other country trying to do that where i mean if i asked you give me your goal for the sake of the united states yeah good luck with that yeah it's, it's sort of like you know you got into this mass american government you can get yourself out of it forget me yeah i mean i i, I don't i mean there's very few countries. i think japan might be another example i mean i look at after uh the typhoon and uh after the uh earthquake not sorry, typhoon the earthquake oh, i guess in the typhoon uh, uh fukushima i mean they they were comparing that situation with what happened in New Orleans. I mean, New Orleans was pandemonium. Japan it just it was orderly as humanly possible. I mean, it's just something about the cultures here where they, when in times of crisis, they stick together and they help themselves. And in New Orleans, it quickly became, look what the government did to the people. That that was like the, the vibe. That was the story told. Yeah, I mean, I I mean, I don't know what their feeling was towards their government about the uh, the relief efforts, but I mean, in the U.S. was crazy. And I mean, there was rioting, there was looting, there was everything, but in Japan, there was not one instance of it. I mean, I mean it kind of really says something about the character of the people. And, and again, in the same respect to the Korean people, when the financial crisis hit, the exact same thing happened. I mean, even after the after Typhoon Mamie here in 2006, I mean, everybody was out cleaning the streets together. And the next morning, nothing bad. Nobody was breaking windows to steal stuff. Nobody was doing anything bad. Everybody just said, "Okay, let's let's fix this and let's get it done." 
So when the financial crisis, which they just call IMF here, hit its depths, did you have a sense of, well, I'm not fully into the society yet, I'm a foreigner, uh, am I going to have to go? Like, is it, was, it, was there a sense of, well, if Koreans are struggling, I'm definitely not going to make it here? Or how would you feel about that? Well, I mean, kind of, of course, because my salary got cut in half. <laughs> so, I mean, at the time, and uh, everyone, all the other foreigners who were living here did as well. So, I mean, a lot of them um, bailed. And, I mean, it really went probably about, a, in Pusan itself, maybe a 60% drop of, of the foreigners here. Like, some of my best friends to this day here are ones who rode through it. We rode through it together, basically. Um, now, on the other hand, if you had U.S. dollars, you could live like a king here at that time because you could you basically tripled your money any time you exchanged it. And plus, with the amount of anybody who was looking for money here, you could get good bargains. But yeah. did you know guys doing that? Oh yeah, of course. Um, yeah, it was a good time for some people bought properties and things like that. But yeah, I mean, it was just a really interesting time to watch because I'd never seen that happen. I mean, I can imagine it was similar to what was going on back in the U.S. with, with the big bailouts back when everybody was struggling. But it was interesting to see the difference between how they were trying to get through it and, and the way that I watched people go through it here. In Korea, you could probably say safely that everybody felt it, at least somewhat. In America, I'm not sure everyone did. I mean, I... I, I was not like 20 years into a career in 2008, you know what I mean? But in, it seems like in Korea, nobody really got out of feeling some part of the IMF time, right? Yeah, well, I, I think, again, the big difference is is that if it happens in the U.S., it affects certain people and the other ones it doesn't affect. But there's such a distance between what the people think of it. Of it. Here, it's a collective, we're all in this together. Whether you're in trouble or not in trouble, the people who aren't in trouble won't flaunt it. They'll try to help them. I mean, I think they'll all at least try to get together and, like, just go through the suffering as a group. Whereas in the States, it would be like, oh, we're suffering. Oh, that's too bad. But, I mean, the, the wealthier people would be like, well... Oh, Sorry about that. Going on my trip to, to Barbados right now. Yeah, it's just something about here. It's just such a collectivist society in some respects that, whereas many people sometimes view it as a negative thing, but in situations like that, it's an absolute positive. Um, yeah, they, they, they just try to help each other as much as they can. And, I mean, just even last in the last two months has shown it, or the last three months, I guess, now it's been, has shown it, Perfectly again with the with the boat the Sewol boat accident the ferry accident I mean events were canceled people would not go out and even have like the after dinner drinks or or they even go to dinners because they they felt like it was such a sad time to be out celebrating I mean they they were even considering canceling the World Cup cheering events just because they didn't know if it was the right time to cheer yet right and it's another illustration of the thinking here that well the government isn't going to necessarily solve our problems so we have to we have to think together in a way you know the sense that the government itself can't get us out of the economic crisis and the sense that when we have a disaster maybe the government doesn't know what to do and that somehow increases solidarity among the people themselves doesn't it absolutely um, and again like the people I've talked to I mean they were absolutely furious with the government and so again their thinking is let's just do it ourselves <laughs> In a way, it's it's not the way we think of, I hate to use the word collectivism, but it's not the way we think of it in the West. We think of, we hear the word collectivist society, and it's, it's, a, it's a society where everybody obeys these detailed dictates from the state to the letter, and it's sort of a, it's kind of a dystopia. Here, it's some, it's collectivist, collectivist without being a... An authoritarian society. I mean, it has its stern points, though. The government, right? They, they have their, they have, the state has their opinions and they enforce them. And uh, there are certain ways you don't want to run afoul of it, right? Yeah, I mean, like it's, I guess it's something I'm not used to, and I and I don't think any like a lot of people from the outside when they look at it, they they, they don't really know what to make of it. But in some ways, um, 
I mean, of course, this country has its faults, just like any other one. But I mean, in some ways, when you look at it, it's like we look at it from a Western point of view and think, like, what are they doing and what are they thinking? But in some ways, it works. Right. Running a media operation here, I mean, are there... From conversations that I have, I get the sense there's a little bit more to watch out for, or like watch what you say. Is that true? Absolutely. Um, the slander and libel laws here are very, very, very strict. Do you know why that is? Uh, public shaming, um, losing face. So you're not really allowed to um, basically say, for example, I don't really know how restaurant reviews here because you're not really allowed to say anything negative against them. I heard they didn't have reviews at all of restaurants for a long time in Korea. Like, that was a new concept. But then the Internet came around and sort of freed that up a lot. Yeah, but again, I mean, a lot of people had to write anonymously because, again, you can be sued for slander against somebody's business for writing that the food's terrible. Oh, wow. Or even that it was cold. I don't know. It doesn't even have to be so harsh. It sounds like they could have just said, it wasn't to my taste, and that could you could be taken to court for that. Yeah, yeah because you're affecting their ability to do business. I mean, again, it's something that I don't understand. Um, but... Again, they, 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 they talk about freedom of the press here, but again, they've Korea's actually got a really low ranking on, on, the, on the press freedom here. Uh, and, and a lot of it is because of that. They, they get shut up quite quickly on things like that. And I mean, even with their internet, um, they had to log in with their IDs everywhere they go, plus with their um, ID numbers and everything. Now, again, if you look at their social media, um, SciWorld, which was actually even big before Facebook. Pre-Facebook Korean, I won't say equivalent, because it was a predecessor. Yeah, I mean, it was, I mean, if they were smart, they could have actually been Facebook. However, um, no, I mean, they tried internationally, it failed for whatever reason. But, I mean, as a, as a foreigner here, if I wanted to join SciWorld... They wanted me to send a, fa a copy of a faxed passport. Huh. There's no way I'm sending my passport information to a company. It's a very Korean thing, though, to have sites or apps that are really Korea only. And if you want to get in on them, even if you live here, it's going to be hard. Um, and again, that's just something. It's just the lack, I think, of a global vision on some things. I, I think it's gotten better. And when they tried to go international, they, they still tried to run it kind of the Korean way. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But, I mean, SciWorld has completely collapsed almost to the point of, I mean, if I ask a group of people how many have it, I mean, it's down to two or three. Kids will just laugh. Yeah. I mean, you ask the younger kids, now they don't even know what it, what it is. It's like if we ask in the States if they have a MySpace page. Exactly. Exactly. But, yeah, I mean, it's it could have been a global leader in social, social media, but, again, it was who wants to give their personal information to a... A company that who knows what they're going to do with it. Now, there is something globally known here in Busan, uh, some, something Korean and homegrown, the Busan International Film Festival, which is if, if somebody knows Busan who's never been to Busan, they probably know it for that. When that comes around, you know, what, what's it like in the media world? Everything, everything changes to revolve around the Busan Festival, it seems like. That's my absolute favorite time of the year. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, for our magazine, it's probably the best time of the year, really. Um, it is the one, I mean, since it's kind of grown, it was the one real true international event, I would say, that was actually in Busan. I mean, everyone, a lot of people here will call us ourselves the International Food Festival. <laughs> well, the International Food Festival should have one, more than one table that sells, like, Turkish kebabs yeah. or... Yeah. Or whatever. But, I mean, the International Film Festival is easily one of the best events of the year here. And not even just in the city, in the country. When you got here, it had just started, had it not? It was about, it was the mid-90s it started, uh, 96, 95, so it was brand new. Yeah. Um, and, you know, to be fair, I didn't really even pay much attention to it until I really started uh, covering it for about the last five years. I didn't really pay much attention, and I guess it, just, it was a it was a growing festival, um, going through growing pains. But I think it had always done pretty well. Um, but when I started covering it, I mean, they've gotten um, higher 
quality celebrity actors and actresses to come visit. The movies are, have become much better. Um, and it's become the number one Asian film festival. Um, they do a lot of um, like international work with and collaborations with other directors from like Korea and Vietnam or Hong Kong, Malaysia. It's and the, the one thing is they do not really focus on Hollywood at all. So it's actually really interesting to see. I mean, like a few years ago, they would try to bring in I think some big name. Uh, Hollywood people just to kind of give it credence, but it's now more. I mean, last year was much more Asian. Right. They didn't need the Hollywood people after all. No, I mean, I, to be fair, I don't even know if they're uh, not really, except for the Irish directors who came. Uh, Neil Jordan uh, came, and but I mean, I think he was the biggest name. And that's been going, the festival's been going since '95. And now the Korean Film Council has moved here. It, there's sort of a push, it seems, to make Busan the film center of of South Korea. Has that? Do you think that's been accomplished yet to come, or still hard to say? I think it's still in its stages, but I think it's well on its way. Um, I mean, you can see a lot more uh, filming done locally, and a lot of stuff has moved down here. Um, it's. I don't, I don't know if the right word is it will always kind of be concentrated down here because, I mean, its soul is still soul. But I think for the majority of what they've done, they've done a really good job. I mean, they built the, the cinema center, which is um, almost a one-of-a-kind building in, in almost any country, really. I mean, nobody really dedicates one cinema center for one major event. I mean, but what they do now is they're running um, a lot of film festivals, like just during the weeks, during the week, or they just finished an Arab film festival, they just finished a Swedish film festival, so they're so they are doing a lot of stuff there. But there's I, always something cinematic going on here, even if the festivals, even if the festival is not happening right at the moment. Yeah, um, they they're also running um, like free movies every Wednesday night. They um, also run concerts there, musical concerts, because they have a really nice outdoor um, stage facility. So, I mean, they do run events, but I mean, it's not something that you kind of really notice unless you really pay attention. It takes, it takes a fair amount of digging, it seems like, in Busan to really be aware of what's going on. You can read Busan Haps, of course, but, you know, someone's got to make Busan Haps. You've got to find out about these things, and it's... Even looking at the map of Busan, at first getting here, I was sort of like... How do I figure out this city? Because the, the layout is even, it seems a little bit confusing at first. But what have, what's been, other than living here 17 years, what's been some ways you've understood Busan, some ways you've come to understand Busan well? Um, I don't know. I, I guess I kind of have a real grip on the city. I know where I'm going all the time, but, um, yeah, I mean, there's places, I mean, it. like I said, it seems like a small town, but it is a pretty huge city. And you, and it's very easy to get lost. Um, but I think for the most people who come here, kind of get just logged into one, or not one, but just certain areas. I mean, Hyundai, of course, uh, Kwangan, also the other beach. But no, a lot of people don't really go to, I would say, 90% of the city. Um, even the way, kind of, you can see the way things are built here. Like you have Kwangali and Hyundai areas, even this area, Kyungsung, Samyeon and Nampodong, which are probably in Pusan National University area and Dongne, kind of the main areas. Now, they kind of have more of an international feel because it's not just um, Korean places, but they mix whether it's fast food places or, or, or Japanese restaurants or Chinese restaurants or even Indian or Thai or something like that. But, I mean, if you go to the other parts of Busan, it's really just like being in old Busan. Um, it's still preserved. Yeah, it's still preserved. And they've, yeah, I mean, that kind of gets you, like, what it is to be in the real Korea. Like, I, I hear a lot of foreigners who come to, to visit here, and they're like, oh, I, I, I experienced the real Busan. Well, I asked, where did you go? I went to Hyundai. I'm like, you didn't experience the real Busan. You experienced a Busan. Yeah, I mean, it's not... It's not the real Korea. I mean, it's kind of, like I said, it's very easy to go to Seoul, 
and just go to Itaewon or wherever and not really experience Korea. I mean, there's such a... I mean, and I think a lot of Asian cities are like that. You can go to Bangkok and, and, and not really experience Thai culture. You don't have to eat Thai food. You don't have to eat... You don't have to speak Thai or whatever. You can get through just by eating any Western food and whatever. But it's yeah, it's just it's something you can actually do. You never really could do that in Busan before, but now you can. I mean, you don't really need to struggle with language here if you don't want to. I mean, just by the places that you stay. But again, you're not experiencing the real Korea if you're doing that. What's something you you enjoy most about the this real Busan, this real Korea, this this Busan that ninety percent don't go to when they travel here? Um, sometimes just like the the old feel of it, just the feeling that I know I'm in a different country. And, and it's kind of a reminder because, again, I can enjoy my afternoon at Starbucks and go to the beach and eat Western food at the beach and go home. However, when I go to that place, I can kind of remember where I am, really. And just think like, oh, yeah, I'm in Asia. Because, I mean, you can almost, I mean, the world has become that global now where you can go to almost any country in the world and not really experience their culture. I feel like you're in an airport. Yeah, and I mean, you can just go here or any, like anywhere and just live the exact same life you're living except you're in a different country. I mean, you don't really, I mean, for me, when you travel, you should really try to kind of learn about the culture and enjoy the food or things like that. Um, it's not just going overseas to another place to go to another Starbucks. So you can set foot on a different landmass and drink a frappuccino. Yeah, except maybe I can see what's different at, at their McDonald's or something like different. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, to me, like going to the older parts of Busan and even sometimes going, they might not be the cleanest, they might be somewhat dirty or old, but I, sometimes I look at it and actually remember what it was like when I moved here. Because, I mean, if you look now, I mean, everything here is... Um, kind of like well designed with nice interiors when i first moved here everything looked like an old house <laughs> and it probably was an old house yeah but i mean i kind of remember when i first moved here like like oh yeah this is what it used to be like and I not don't always enjoy it per se but i mean it's it's kind of interesting to think back like oh yeah it used to be like that nice. now finally you, you know you we talk about korea pulling through the financial crisis things always improving here both Seoul and Busan are seen as cities with, with bright futures. You mentioned you did some work before coming here. Uh, you did some work in Detroit. Was that clearly not a city with a future at the time? Oh, God, Detroit. Um, well, luckily, I worked in the suburbs, but... <laughs> Many do, it seems. Yeah. Most do. Yeah, but, I mean, I had actually gone to school downtown, uh, Wayne State, for about... I just I went there for a semester, and... Um, met a lot of really good friends there, and it was really interesting because the rule at Wayne State was don't go three blocks off campus. Oh and, my! Yeah, and that was the first. It's probably down to one now. Yeah, and it was that was the first thing I was told by by the friends that I met. Um, so, so did you violate that rule, or did you adhere to that rule? Uh, well, Detroit's an interesting place because we, I mean, we would sometimes go maybe about three and a half blocks. Yeah, but. But I mean, bold day. Yeah, I mean, I, I I love the city of Detroit. I mean, I spent a lot of time in Detroit, and it's still to me, it's almost like home. Really? How do you go back? I uh, haven't for a while, but because um, I haven't gone home for about four years now. But I mean, I, I still think of Detroit as, even though I'm from Windsor, I I associate with Detroit. I mean, growing up where I did, you, we grew up with American TV. We grew up with um, like going to Detroit shopping or going to the U.S. for TV whatever. radio signals coming from Detroit. Yeah, I mean, I didn't even watch Canadian TV ever. So when I meet other Canadians, I mean, they they talk about that. I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Right. Every time I go home, every time um, when I go to shopping or something like that, everybody, the first question they ask, especially, I went to Toronto the last time I was home, and the first thing, where are you from in the U.S.? I'm Canadian. No, you're not. Uh, yes, I am. Why? Because my accent's more American, I guess, than Canadian. Just growing do, up. Do you say process or process? Process. Okay, well, that's the, that, there we go. If you say process, you're, you get a U.S. passport, I think. Yeah. 
Well, it's funny because most people here think I'm American as well for some reason. Um, but yeah, it's just, I mean, Detroit, it's, it, it's kind of tough to watch it deteriorate. I mean, I'm watching it from a distance now, but I mean, it's, it's always sad to hear what's happening there. Nobody's uh, turning in their gold there. No. Um, and I mean, like, even my friends, I have a couple of friends who still work in the media there, and I mean, it's just, sometimes it's painful to watch. It really, really is. And just to see them reporting on what they do and, it's, and just the problems there that have been going on and on and on and on and on. I mean, it's really sad because, I mean, like I said, I have a lot of friends here uh, also from my area who are all kind of basically grew up like me it's just it's Detroit <laughs> and I mean it's not even just Detroit I mean it was like watching like when Cleveland or which I spent quite a few quite a bit of time in as well um, just watching that go downhill I mean it's really it sounds back a bit yeah um, but I mean I'm talking like years ago like I remember going to the to the flats in Cleveland and I don't even think they're there anymore but I mean it was such a fun time to go down there and and just hang out and see the people and then next thing I know you not even there it's just it's I don't know it's just kind of really really interesting to watch what's happening I would say in the US and Canada from a distance um, I mean just through watching CNN or whatever it's, it's just really really strange to watch it from a distance having grown up there for the first 24 25 years of my life for friends back home and now they now understand better why you're here uh you know i don't know <laughs> um it's funny because i mean they'll, they'll ask me like well you must really love it over there and i'm like well, i don't know if that's the right answer oh, yeah. um because i know i think with most foreigners here there is a love relationship or love hate relationship with with where you live overseas um i think just for me it's i grew up there and i don't know if i say i'm finished with it but i mean that was a part of my life that um i went through and then i came here and then i just find it more exciting living overseas and meeting new people every day from all over the world whereas back home in the area i live in it's just kind of you live there and it's one of those that you don't leave it wasn't a gateway to anywhere no and in that's why i when i first got here and i started meeting a lot of people from all over the place even when i was home i used to try and get away as much as i could i would i once with a friend drove to uh south bend to go get taco bell and then drove home for five hours. I mean, just, just to get out of the city. We once drove to Chicago to... I don't even remember why we went to Chicago. I mean, I used to call... My father would be like... I Back in the days of collect calls, my my dad my dad would answer the phone. He's like, again? Like, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm in Toronto. <laughs> or I'm in... Or wherever I was. It was just... Yeah, we just used to drive around. So I think I always kind of had that travel itch. Which is um, kind of the same as my father. My father was born in Germany, moved, immigrated to Canada when he was, I think, 19, and he kind of did the same thing. He moved when he was young and ended up staying in the country that, that he was actually planning to leave as well. So, But he met my mother and they got married, <laughs> and he stayed. Everyone plans to leave the place they go to. Many don't. Yeah, and I'm one of those just like him who ends up staying. <laughs> I've been speaking here in Busan, South Korea with Jeff Leipsch. He's the managing editor and a partner in Busan Haps, the English language magazine here in town. You can read him also on, uh, is it BusanHaps.com they can find your writing and others? Yeah, BusanHaps.com. You can read his writing on sports and other subjects and other contributors there about what's going on in Busan. Jeff, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was a great time. This has been Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org. Thanks. And special thanks to all the backers of Notebook on Cities and Culture's Korea tour on Kickstarter. Adam Hartzell, Aidan Nullman, Alfred Lee, Andy Cooney, Angus Gordon, Bala Chenupati, Cam Smith, Chin Music Press, Dan Caraselli, Danny, Deborah Smith, Emmett Ferriger, Humberto Grant, Ian Plosker, Ismail Kennessy, Jackie Gast, Jay Chang, Jeffrey Davis, James DeVito, Jonathan Filbert, 
Josh Paget, Kimberly Hahn, Manvir, Mark Hines, Matthew, Matthew Workman, Maureen Kincaid Speller, Monica Eck, Michael Fransky, MJ Pritchett, Patrick O'Flaherty, Patrick Park, Piers Rippey, Robert Salzberg, Samuel Hansen, Sean Brown, Themistocles Chacrusis, Thomas Unterberger, Timothy Dobbs, and Wayne Wright. <laughs>